Good morning. For the next five centuries, business schools around the world and public policy universities around the world are going to be studying our semiconductor sanctions against China and how they played out. Because these sanctions have been the biggest unforced error maybe in the history of global business. It's a great case study, too, in the law of unintended consequences. Our intention was to cripple the Chinese semiconductor industry, but we killed our own semiconductor industries instead. And it's hard to see. Honestly, it's hard to see how things could have gone worse than they have. If our idea was to decouple from China, or to prevent China from building semiconductor chips, or to deny Chinese semiconductor companies a future market to the rest of the world, that we wanted to keep all those markets for ourselves. I'll say again, it's impossible to see how things could have turned out worse than they have. Pre-sanctions, before we put sanctions on, here is how the system worked. Really smart guys in the US and Japan and Korea and Europe would design computer chips that get faster and smaller and better. They gave those designs to really smart guys in Taiwan and in a few other places to build those chips. Those guys in Taiwan and in a few other places, they need special equipment to help them make them. So they buy this equipment from really smart guys in the Netherlands and in a few other places. Then the chips go to the world market. Chinese companies buy a lot of those chips to put into their electronics and their cars and their planes, appliances, all of that. That is how the market for semiconductors worked and everybody was happy. Chinese companies that wanted the best chips and fastest chips would buy from Western companies who designed them and then they built them in giant chip factories in Asia using equipment made in Europe. The semiconductor sanctions that we put on stopped the export of many of these chips to China. China responded by ramping up their buys of chips that were not under sanction and also bought the equipment necessary to make them so that they could still have chips to sell for their consumer products and their electronics. Then they poured a lot of money and resources into building their own chip making industry. And that is just what happened. Now the Chinese are building chips that they were not supposed to be able to build. And now Huawei phones are using those chips and blowing up the sales of iPhone here and everywhere else that Huawei is allowed to sell. China also embraced Risk 5 open source chips, started making those and last year exported, exported. They built these chips here and exported five billion risk chips. They weren't supposed to be able to build them at all, and yet they shipped five billion of them. So five billion chips that came from China that did not come from chip makers back home. Over the past month, investors on Wall Street are finally starting to understand the problem. The demand for chips from U.S. companies are not going to be there at anywhere close to the levels they thought. The profit margins for sure will not be if China is building chips for their own market and supplying plenty of the global market besides. And to be honest, this is something I wondered if I was missing when I saw the share prices of these companies go up, up and up. China was such a huge market for these companies. And so where are the new customers going to come from to replace China? And now that China's figured out how to make them and they're exporting them in mass volumes to global markets, what are institutional and retail investors in the United States seeing that I'm not seeing? Well, over the past month, they started to see it and they're selling. Semiconductor stocks are getting slammed across the board and they dragged the NASDAQ back to where it was in 2021, September 2021. 
the semiconductor index of the S&P is off 17% from its high back in late March. It's only mid-April now, so it's just a few weeks, down 17. Here is NVIDIA. NVIDIA is a designer of the highest end chips used in AI. It dropped 10% just yesterday and is off, what's this, 190 points since late March. That's $250 billion or so in market cap gone in one month. ARM Holdings, that was a big IPO last year, down 17% on the day, off 60 points from its high in February. Supermicro, down 23% on the day and off 40% or so since March. Intel, which makes the chips that would be pushed out of the global market by China's risk chips. They're down 32% since Christmas. And here's Taiwan Semiconductor, down 20 points in a month. I guess investors are figuring out that if we're gonna be selling fewer chips, TSMC is gonna be making fewer chips. I know that this is only one month or so, and anything can happen tomorrow. But the premise here was always a very deeply flawed one, that China in the 2020s is not like Russia in the 1980s, or the Cuban tourist or cigar industries in the 1970s when we started sanctioning them. But our idea was that we could blow the dust off these playbooks and apply them here and now to semiconductors in China. The companies that supplied China with the chips that China needed, they also needed China to buy them. You can't take China out of the demand side and not see a collapse in sales of almost anything, but definitely not semiconductors. And if China cannot buy semiconductors, they needed to learn how to build them and fast. And once they did that, it's not just China who won't be buying chips from NVIDIA or Intel and Micron. Nobody else will be either. China is now a producer and an exporter of high speed, high quality chips. They compete on cost and on quality. And if you don't believe that China long term will be successful at doing that, then I have very good news for you. You can buy these chip maker stocks from the United States. They're on sale and they're 30% off. Be good. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, thank you for the depression, for the hope coming.